All right, uh, chapter 51, musculoskeletal. Um, musculoskeletal refers to a very complex system made up of bones, nerves, vessels, muscles, tendons, ligaments, and joints. And during trauma, bones can be fractured, vessels and nerves can be severed, muscles, tendons, and ligaments can be torn, and joints can be dislocated. Some of the more common injuries you'll see with musculoskeletal include sprains and strains, uh, both open and closed fractures, and joint dislocations. Um, some of the concerns with musculoskeletal trauma, uh, depending on what um, bone is fractured, um, hemorrhage may be an issue. Certainly as an example, if you have bilateral open femur fractures uh, or even bilateral femur fractures, uh, the, the hemorrhage inside each of those uh, muscles could be significant enough uh, to cause shock. Um, tissue damage from the sharp bone ends, uh, if the bones protrude through the skin, now you have an open fracture which uh, sets up not only infection at the wound site but infection of the bone itself. And because a nerve, an artery, and a vein follows along every bone, uh, there could be both vascular and nerve damage. Um, direct injury can be blunt or penetrating, applied to uh, the bone or a group of bones, as in the chest. Uh, it occurs at the point of impact, and here they're illustrating a, a bumper of a car striking a femur. <clears throat> it can be an indirect injury that occurs away from the point of impact. Um, the impact sends a wave of energy through the body. So what they're illustrating here is falling on an outstretched hand. Uh, several things could happen uh, if the uh, uh, force of the impact is transmitted to the wrist. Both the radius and the ulnus can fracture. If that doesn't happen, the elbow can dislocate. If that doesn't happen, you can have a humerus fracture, dislocated shoulder. But one of the most common um, types of injuries that we see uh, from a fall on an outstretched hand, particularly in children, is a, a clavicle fracture. Twisting injuries <clears throat> are common in lower extremities, uh, particularly when your feet are bound, like in the picture here with skis, uh, and there's a, a twisting uh, sort of um, motion. Bones or ligaments are taken beyond their uh, natural positions, and they're twisted into an abnormal state. Um, causing uh, trauma as well. <coughs> Penetrating injuries uh, can be caused by firearms, knives, construction equipment, um, uh, pieces of sharp metal in a motor vehicle collision. Uh, the skin breaks with exposure of the bones, the joints, the muscles as a result of the destructive forces. Uh, you can have pathological injuries as well because uh, people with long-term illnesses or um, the normal part of aging and the thinning of the bone um, uh, can lead to um, bone disorders uh, causing um, uh, bones to fracture easily. Uh, arthritis, osteoporosis uh, also destruct the joints and the um, uh, where bones articulate. Uh, <clears throat> they make the patient more susceptible to inflammation, fractures, discomfort, and they weaken the bone as well from uh, loss of calcium. Some common risk factors associated with musculoskeletal trauma include participating in contact sports, uh, operating or riding a motor vehicle, operating heavy machinery or farm equipment, operating off-road vehicles, falling from a height, uh, participating in outdoor activities, uh, like hiking, climbing, horseback riding, snow skiing, water skiing, uh, running or participating in other non-contact sports also increase your risk of musculoskeletal trauma. Uh, prevention is uh, key to all um, trauma. Uh, if we could prevent the injury from occurring in the first place, that would be far better. Um, and prevention begins with proper sports training, uh, proper personal protective equipment uh, when participating in uh, sports or uh, when um, uh, rollerblading or uh, longboarding or any of those sort of things, uh, having the proper helmets and uh, knee guards and wrist guards and those sort of things. Uh, seatbelt use in motor vehicles, child safety seats, 
uh, airbags, uh, gun safety education programs, uh, motorcycle education for on and off-road users, uh, motor education as well. All these things um, are in place uh, to help prevent trauma. Uh, and while um, uh, while taken by uh, many adults, uh, many of these programs like gun safety, uh, motorcycle uh, permit riding, boater education uh, are actually geared towards uh, the younger population uh, as they begin learning uh, how to ride a motorcycle, use a gun or a boat. Uh, same thing holds true with snowmobiles. Uh, muscles and skeleton make uh, movement possible. Uh, the bones protect your internal structures. Uh, and the bones are part of uh, an important piece of your metabolic function, particularly uh, the release of calcium. Uh, bo bones form the basis of your skeletal system. Uh, in addition to the bones, there's nervous tissue, blood vessels, uh, bone tissue, and then connective tissue is your ligaments and tendons. Uh, when we look at a bone, uh, there are several parts to the bone. The epiphysis, uh, that is the round end of the bones where they articulate with other joints. Uh, the diaphysis is the actual shaft of the bone. Uh, the periosteum is a, a covering over the bone. Uh, the medullary cavity is the center of the bone where vessels lie. And when you do an I.O., you're accessing that medullary cavity. Uh, the medullary cavity is, is not... Uh, uh, does not go clear to the end of each bone. Uh, so that's why we have to uh, measure and find our uh, anatomy when doing an I.O. Bones with other bones form joints, uh, and they're connected with ligaments. Uh, L-I-G, B to B is how I remember that. Ligaments connect bone to bone. And uh, uh, skeletal muscles are attached to bones by tendons. Uh, ligaments are a thick connective tissue. They connect bone to bone at the joints. Uh, they're very dense, uh, a lot of striations, very strong, uh, but certainly when stretched beyond uh, a normal position, they can tear. Tendons are thick connective tissue that connects muscle to bone. It too is a dense connective tissue. Uh, it's a continuation of the fascia that covers the skeletal muscle group, uh, and those too can be uh, torn. Um, some age-associated changes to keep in mind is uh, that children, their cartilage, their ligaments, and their tendons have not grown to full length, so they are more pliable. Uh, they tend not to break, which is sort of a protective mechanism, but if the bone is damaged, it, it may not uh, uh, be evident. Uh, they bend with impact, uh, and they don't do as good a job protecting the organs because uh, of their uh, give. In the elderly patient, uh, their bones uh, are certainly uh, not as strong. Uh, they are more brittle. Uh, they have less elasticity and strength to their skin. Uh, they're at higher risk for spinal cord injuries, head injuries, uh, and remember that falls is the leading cause of death in the elderly. Uh, hypoventilation may occur as well with an injured thoracic region uh, due to a variety of factors. Uh, as a person ages, their lung capacity decreases, um, and uh, uh, their muscle strength to take that deep breath uh, is affected as well. Now, when we look at injuries to the musculoskeletal system, uh, we can have fractures that are open, closed. There could be a break in the cortex of the bone. Uh, but any, at any uh, event, uh, fractures are painful. Uh, and most people who break a bone, if you've ever broken one, you know exactly where the break is. You can point right to it. And that's what we refer to as point tenderness. Uh, they'll tell you right where uh, the fracture is. They may have heard a pop or a crack or a split. Um, but because, again, an, an, a nerve, an artery, and a vein run along your long bones, uh, there can be blood loss. Uh, and if it's the femurs, the blood loss could be significant enough to cause shock. Uh, open fractures, uh, again, increase the risk of infection not only to the wound, um, but um, to the bone itself. Uh, they could get an osteomyelitis, which can be uh, very difficult to, uh, to uh, cure. Uh, so it's very important that uh, when we do have uh, exposed bone ends uh, through an open wound that uh, we don't try to stuff them back in the hole, uh, but do put a, a dressing and a 
uh, bandage over that uh, to protect from uh, pathogens and to control external hemorrhage. Uh, different types of fractures can be seen, um, incomplete or simple fractures, uh, oblique fractures, closed or open, uh, impacted fractures, um, comminuted where there's a lot of broken pieces, a displaced spiral, uh, and displaced transverse. And um, when you look at a spiral fracture, that's, of course, the result of a twisting mechanism. Uh, impacted fractures, the result of uh, falling on an outstretched arm. Um, you know, displaced and comminuted could be a direct blow uh, to the uh, uh, bone itself. Other types of fractures, comminuted, uh, green stick. Green stick we see in... Um, uh, in children, uh, because their bones are, um, because their bones are um, very uh, soft, uh, they're much like a green stick. And when you take a green stick and bend it, it doesn't really snap uh, like a dried old stick. It kind of just splinters and stays together. Uh, spiral we already talked about, oblique and transverse we already talked about. Stress fractures uh, can occur as a result of hammering bones uh, typically seen with um, uh, runners, um, uh, more commonly called shin splints. Um, and uh, they can also be uh, uh, prevalent in the elderly. Uh, pediatrics are susceptible to long bone breaks at the epiphyseal plate. And of course, the epiphyseal plate is the growth plate. Uh, and if the fracture goes through the growth plate, uh, the bone itself may quit growing. Uh, hemorrhage may be common with fractures. So you want to get a history of the event, uh, determine the mechanism, uh, and assess for DCAP BTLS. Uh, in addition to swelling, redness, deformity, whether or not there's any open wounds, you want to check CMS as well to make sure that there's no uh, uh, circulation that's occluded or nerves that are damaged. So checking distal pulses, uh, checking their ability to feel you touch, and checking their ability to wiggle their toes or fingers. Uh, for fractures, you're going to immobilize them. And the uh, potential for immobilization are, are wide and varied. Uh, there's a variety of different splints out there that are um, uh, quite functional in uh, controlling hemorrhage, or excuse me, in, uh, in uh, splinting. Uh, and we have to follow the, um, the basic principle of splinting, and that's to immobilize the joint above and below the suspected fracture site. If we just immobilize one site, either above or below, uh, they still have movement of that extremity, which could cause the fracture to uh, uh, move. And, and if there are sharp bone ends, could increase the risk of cutting a vein or a, uh, an artery or a nerve if it hasn't done so already. Uh, you want to address any open wounds, control hemorrhage. Uh, ice is OK, uh, which will decrease swelling and alleviate some of the pain. Um, we know that we don't want trauma patients to get cold, uh, but if we're just putting ice on an isolated ankle injury uh, or an isolated elbow or you know a forearm injury, then um, then that's okay. Uh, pain control, you, as a paramedic, you have the ability to alleviate the pain, and and uh, you should do so um, uh, to provide uh, relief to uh, that patient. Uh, relief. Um, of the pain uh, allows uh, the muscles to relax, allows for healing to begin uh, frequently, and uh, it's been shown that uh, patients uh, who have their uh, pain controlled uh, sooner than later uh, have better outcomes. Sprains occur when ligaments are stretched beyond the normal range of motion. Uh, it can be, cause a tearing. Uh, you also have to consider the possibility of other injuries like fractures and dislocations. Now, differentiating a sprain from a fracture in the field is very difficult, and they may have both a sprain and a fracture. So the treatment is to, uh, you know, uh, immobilize, ice, uh, manage pain, and um, the ice is 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, and it's not placed directly on the skin. Uh, you can use a cold pack wrapped in a towel and uh, place it over the injury site. 
strains are damage to the muscle and or tendons caused by excessive use or a forcible stretching. Um, your mechanism of injury is, is going to be that of uh, an overexertion or an overextension. And uh, strains are, uh, occur in the back, uh, low back strains, uh, strains to the arms and the legs. Um, they're going to be painful as well. Uh, very difficult to determine a strain from a sprain from a fracture uh, unless it's quite obvious. Uh, so treatment is going to be the same. You're going to mobilize uh, ice uh, in uh, pain control. Dislocations occur when articulating bones of the joint are displaced from their natural position of function. Uh, common areas of dislocation include the shoulders, the elbows, the fingers, the hips, the knees, the ankles. And I don't think they left out any joints. So uh, dislocations occur uh, at a joint. Um, the presentation is the joint's going to be locked. Um, the the uh, dislocated part is going to be deformed or look deformed, uh, and they will have false motion. Uh, immediate definitive care is to immobilize them into position of function. Uh, we're typically not taught to relocate a dislocation, uh, cover with a cool uh, compress, uh, ice pack, and uh, uh, manage their pain. Uh, here's just a picture of a dislocated finger, and you can see that the, uh, in that particular case, the supporting um, ligaments have to be stretched beyond all means and maybe even torn. Muscle contusions are damage to the tissue without disruption of the skin, and when you have a deep muscle bruise, uh, in addition to it being very painful, uh, you also have to consider the possibility of a fracture. So uh, look at the mechanism of injury. Was it a crushing? Was it a blunt object impact, a blast injury, a fall from a height? All these things could cause muscle contusions uh, in combination with a fracture. Uh, evaluate. Evaluation of a disruption or fracture to the bone. Um, you know, do they have point tenderness? Do they have swelling? Do they have uh, these things that you commonly see with fractures? If, if you're in doubt, uh, you know, whether or not it could be a fracture, then it's 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 advisable to just splint it, uh, put some ice on it, check CMS before and after applying any splint. Uh, here they call it PMS, pulse motor sensation. Uh, CMS would be circulation motor sensory. Um, but in any event, assess their, their distal function and um, administer pain medications to alleviate pain. Now, those could be uh, morphine, um, uh, certainly could be fentanyl, uh, tortol, um, tortol being the least effective, but uh, uh, is, uh, is an NSAID. Compartment syndrome occurs when uh, structures are constricted within a space. Uh, you've got a periosteum that covers the bones. You have a peri you have a, a, a a membrane that covers all the muscles as well, and the joints uh, are encapsulated. And um, when uh, you have fluid accumulate in these uh, closed spaces, fluid is non-compressible, so something in that space has to give, and it can um, collapse the vessels inside that capsule, uh, decreasing blood supply to it. Uh, it can... Um, uh, you know, cause nerve damage, muscle damage, uh, and is a, uh, a serious uh, a situation. Signs and symptoms, uh, pain out of proportion to the injury. You know, you look at the injury and you go, oh, yeah, that might hurt a little bit, but this person is just writhing all over the cot. Uh, tension of the muscle during a relaxed state. So even if the, if, even if the patient is, is in a position where the muscle should feel relaxed and loose, uh, it feels very firm. Uh, loss of distal sensation, uh, extreme pain on trying to stretch the muscle at all, and then a, a pulse deficit in the injured extremity. Um, uh, signs and symptoms of musculoskeletal trauma, this should have been one of the very first slides, uh, is DCAP BTLS, uh, just like we've always been taught as an EMT. Uh, we're looking for deformity, we're looking for bruises, abrasions, punctures, burns, uh, tenderness, lacerations, swelling. Uh, 
Other signs would be diffuse pain, point tenderness, painful movement, swelling and skin tension, crepitus when you hear the bone ends grate, uh, unable to flex or move the uh, uh, extremity in the normal range of motion, uh, difficulty breathing if you've got thoracic or chest trauma, and then false movement. Some other signs would be loss of pulse distal to the injury, loss of sensation. Um, the position in which the limb is found, if it's anatomically not correct, if it veers off at a 45 degree angle when it should be straight, I mean, obviously you know that that is, uh, that's trauma to that uh, particular uh, bone or joint. Uh, hematomas uh, can exist as well if the extremity is cyanotic. Uh, then, uh, of course, you know that uh, circulation is compromised. Uh, and then the patient uh, often will guard or self-splint the extremity uh, in order to help alleviate some of the pain. Bursitis is an inflammation of the bursa sacs of the joints. It's a long-term problem caused by repetitive motion. Uh, it's also been linked to gout. Uh, and infection, and we know that gout is a an extremely painful condition uh, as a result of an increase in uric acid. Uh, bursitis uh, results in uh, daily pain. Um, the bursa is the uh, small fluid-filled sac. Uh, it provides cushion uh, at a pressure point of or near your joint, and uh, when it's inflamed, uh, the joint cannot perform. So when the bursa gets inflamed, uh, it's called bursitis. Uh, on physical exam, you're going to have pain with movement, limited range of motion. Uh, the muscle may atrophy as a result of not being able to use it. Uh, the pain gets worse over weeks. Uh, they may have a history of repetitive activity uh, and may have other underlying conditions uh, possible. Treatment for bursitis is rest, ice, analgesics, and NSAIDs. Tendonitis is an inflammation of the tendon caused by trauma or excessive use of an extremity. Signs and symptoms include tenderness, pain, restricted movement of muscle attached to a tendon, swelling, lim limited distal function, and limited range of motion. Um, probably uh, one of the more common examples of tendonitis is uh, tennis elbow. Treatment is to immobilize it, uh, administer pain meds if they're having significant pain, uh, and transport. Arthritis, the joint becomes inflamed. Uh, signs and symptoms are pain, swelling, stiffness, and redness. Uh, it's caused by osteoarthritis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, gouty arthritis. Arthritis can often mimic fractures and dislocations. Um, you have to evaluate uh, whether or not this, um, this uh, pain in um, an arthritic area is new uh, or is it something that they chronically have. Uh, in any event, if it is new and you suspect a fracture, immobilize, give them medication for pain control, uh, and they may need higher doses of analgesics because of the uh, significance of, of pain associated with arthritis. Um, if you've got an isolated injury, you can perform a focus ass assessment. In other words, if the only thing I have is somebody twisted their ankle and uh, now they've got uh, perhaps an open fracture of the ankle uh, and they've got no other, you know, they didn't hit their head, they weren't knocked out, they have no neck back pain, it's just their ankle, then you can focus your assessment on just the ankle. Uh, when you're dealing with multi-systems trauma, however, uh, you need to do that full head-to-toe examination. Uh, and prior to any of that, uh, manage your uh, ABCs. Uh, as far as categories go, musculoskeletal uh, injuries can be categorized as patients with life or limb-threatening injuries, uh, including life or limb-threatening musculoskeletal trauma. Uh, patients with other life or limb threatening injuries and only simple muscular skeletal trauma. Patients with life limb threatening musculoskeletal trauma and no other life limb threatening injuries. And patients only with isolated injuries that are not life or limb threatening. Um, so while it's not common to have a limb injury that could be life threatening, uh, it does occur and requires your full assessment. Your primary survey, you're going to look look for the six P's, and the six P's are are something that you definitely see in compartment syndrome, which would be a extreme emergency in um, 
uh, extremity trauma. The six P's include pain, pallor, paresthesia, pulses, pressure, and paralysis. You want to avoid excessive movement of that extremity. Uh, feel the extremity for skin temperature. Check your distal pulses. Check for crepitus. Uh, touch, touch the distal to the injured area and ask the patient if they can feel the touch. If not, that would include your, um, your paresthesia. Numbness or tingling, uh, get a history uh, of the event. Uh, this is just a, a, a good um, reminder of things that we should consider when dealing with musculoskeletal trauma. Uh, if we suspect a fracture, and uh, we should, as we don't have x-ray vision, uh, based on mechanism and the way that the patient describes it, uh, we need to immobilize it. Uh, following the basic principle of immobilization to splint the joint above and below uh, the injury site with uh, whatever materials we have available. Uh, some use a mnemonic rice, others use a mnemonic ices. Uh, rice would be rest, ice, compression, elevation. Uh, ices would be ice, compression, elevation, and splint. Um, so those are just good uh, a uh, quick reference to how we manage musculoskeletal trauma. Splints, you want to assess the pulse uh, before and after you splint. Uh, expose the injury site before attempting to splint. Immobilize above and below the injury. Cover open wounds. Control bleeding before splinting. Um, do not push bone ends back into the skin. Uh, if at all possible, immobilize the extremity in the correct anatomic position, uh, which should be the position of comfort. Uh, use inline traction um, to gently um, uh, retract the muscle that may be um, uh, contracted as a result of uh, the trauma. Uh, pat all splints because they may be on a, a, the patient for a while. Uh, there are rigid splints, and they do not conform to the extremity. They must be the correct size. It could include a board, cardboard, wire ladder, piece of plastic, padded arm board, or contoured metal splint. Soft splints are pliable. They're adjustable. Uh, once applied, they may become rigid. They include pillows, blankets, air splints, vacuum splints, SAM splints, padded flexible aluminum splints, and a sling and a swath. Traction splints are designed for mid-shaft closed femur fractures. Uh, they're going to limit tissue damage and pain by aligning and stabilizing the fracture site. They do help reduce bleeding. Uh, the patient must be put on a backboard to stabilize the femur. Uh, there are a couple different devices that could be used to do this. The hair traction splint, the Kendrick, the Kendrick traction device, and the Sager traction splint. Uh, in our part of the country, we're just more familiar with the hair traction. There are two types of traction splints. There are the unipolar, which is just one pole, uh, which is the Sager, which is on the top. And then, of course, bipolar, where there are two bars, one on either side of the leg, and that would be the hair. Uh, rigid and flexible splints. You want to manually stabilize the injured extremity, assess your PMS, Place the extremity in the position of function. Apply some gentle traction. Size up the splint. Place the splint. Wrap it snugly. Reevaluate CMS and apply ice. Traction splints. You man manually immobilize the leg. You check your CMS. You measure from the ischium and extend six to eight inches beyond the extremity. Secure the ischial strap first. Then sh sh secure the traction hook at the distal extremity, apply the traction, and then position additional securing straps last, and then reassess uh, PMS, and then apply ice. Upper extremity injuries, uh, the shoulder could be injured. Uh, it's more prevalent in older adults. Uh, it's a result of uh, extending an arm to break a fall. And uh, in this particular picture, if you look on the um, left, which would be the patient's right, uh, they've got some shoulder drop uh, where the um, uh, could be a dislocation or fracture.
Uh, management, assess PMS of the injured extremity. So if you've got a shoulder injury, assess PMS in the, in the hand of that arm. Uh, apply a sling and swath is my favorite. Uh, and you should practice that in the lab. Uh, apply ice, uh, administer medication for pain, uh, assess for further injuries. And depending on the mechanism of injury, uh, consider and evaluate damage to the chest wall as well. Uh, here they're just showing you how to position a triangular bandage over the chest, uh, how to tie it around the neck, and uh, uh, securing the arm with a swath. Now the sling uh, uh, immobilizes the clavicle, the shoulder, the forearm, the elbow, the um, upper arm, the wrist, the hand, uh, but you can still kick that elbow out which would allow shoulder and clavicle movement. So by applying a swath, uh, you prevent that, um, that elbow from kicking out. Upper extremity injuries include injuries to the humerus. Uh, trauma to the humerus can result in a fracture of the bone. It, it's very difficult to stabilize. Uh, there is a potential for severe circulatory problems as you have some major arteries and veins running along that uh, humerus. It's uh, more common in children and the elderly. And if you're unsure whether the humerus is fractured, then uh, go ahead and splint it. Uh, and again, my preference for anything upper extremity is sling and swath. As long as you can get the arm to bend across the chest, uh, sling and swath is the, the simplest and most efficient um, way to immobilize any sort of upper extremity injury. Um, immobilizing reduces internal hemorrhage as well. Uh, assess for PMS before and after immobilization. Uh, now, you can consider realignment of a fracture if, uh, if there is no circulation. Uh, our orthopods uh, would recommend that that's something we consider if we're more than two hours out. And uh, we're never more than two hours out unless we're on a transfer or something like that. But So they recommend that we just splint it in the position found and bring it in, and they'll do the straightening. Uh, you can use your body as a splint as well, and this works well, um, you know, strapping the uh, arm to the side of the chest using the body as a, a splint. Uh, ice uh, on the injured area and pain medication. Elbow injuries. Elbow injuries are, uh, you know, extremely painful. I don't know if you've ever had one, but you probably all have at some point in time bumped your funny bone, uh, and that runs right along your elbow. So oftentimes, if there's a dislocation, fracture, uh, that sort of injury to the elbow, uh, that ulnar nerve is is pinched or involved, and in, and can be extremely painful. Um, just like anything else, sling and swath works great for this. Uh, do your PMS checks before and after splinting. Uh, ice, elevate pain meds. Uh, wrist injuries uh, typically involve the distal radius and the illness or any of the eight carpal bones in the wrist. Uh, assess all adjacent structures. Uh, assess PMS and range of motion. Uh, here is an example of uh, a fracture. Uh, this piece here is broken off of this bone here and here you can see it better there's a fracture through there and then this head is snapped off and shifted over uh, radial ulnar wrist injuries uh, assess for PMS uh, splint uh, Splitting the hand into position of function, that's where you're going to put a little roll of gauze in the hand uh, so it slightly cocks the hand back. Uh, and then you could use a padded board splint, but then I would put them in a sling and a swath as well. Uh, ice, elevate, and pain control if they're having serious pain. Okay, and here's an example of a couple. Uh, you know, this would uh, do a forearm. This uh, would not do an elbow because the shoulder is not immobilized, uh, but could do a wrist and a forearm. Uh, same here. Uh, this does immobilize the shoulder by the swath. Uh, so this would be good for anything in this area. Uh, hand injuries, you can have lacerations and hematomas. You want to assess anterior and posterior regions of the hand, PMS, 
splint the hand in a position of function, ice, elevate, and pain meds like we do all fractures. Uh, here they're giving you an example of what the position of function is. I mentioned having the uh, having something rolled up uh, so that they can cup, uh, which slightly uh, extends the wrist, uh, which puts all the muscles in the least, um, it relaxes all the muscles uh, associated with the hand when you do that. Uh, the x-ray on the left uh, shows what's commonly called a boxer's fracture. Um, it occurs when you uh, strike a wall or another face or something like that, uh, and you fracture that last um, metacarpal. Uh, phalange injuries, uh, they can be broken as well, uh, amputated. Uh, if the fracture is open, there again, there's always a risk of uh, infection. Uh, splinting, you can uh, tape it to a, a tongue blade or uh, use a buddy splint and uh, tape it to the uh, non-injured uh, finger uh, on either side. Uh, evaluate PMS and range of motion. Evaluate each joint for pain, deformity, range of motion, and swelling. And what they mean by that is you've got your your um, your proximal interphalangeal uh, joint, uh, your distal interpharyngeal joint, and your mid interpharyngeal joint. So you've got the three joints uh, in each finger that you need to assess for. Splint by taping the finger to the adjacent finger. Uh, always splint in the anatomical position. Uh, if there's an amputated or missing finger, you should try to locate them and bring them with if possible. Uh, management, splint it in the position of function, transport any amputated parts, ice, elevate, and pain meds, just like we do pretty much any fracture. Uh, when transporting ampu amputated parts, if you can get the amputated parts and they do fit in a uh, baggie, place them uh, in a baggie and then place the bag in a, another bag with uh, ice and or ice water. Uh, lower extremities have a rich blood supply. You can have extensive internal bleeding, particularly in the femur, uh, and uh, there is a significant amount of pain with these as well. Uh, here they're including the uh, pelvis as a lower extremity, uh, and the uh, picture shows uh, multiple uh, fractures through the ramus of the pelvis uh, where the pubis symphysis is there, which holds all the pelvic girdle together. Um, very vascular. Um, very serious uh, when this uh, bone is fractured just because of the major vessels, the femoral arteries and femoral veins that run down through the pelvic cavity. They too can be damaged. Uh, they're going to have abdominal distension, rigidity, tenderness if there's bleeding into the pelvic cavity. Uh, stabilize the pelvis before moving. And this is extremely controversial right now. Uh, pelvic binders, uh, sheets, um, my favorite, and I've always been taught by my orthopods, uh, if you suspect a pelvic fracture, the best thing that you can do is put a pillow between the patient's legs, tie their legs together, uh, which will splint the pelvis. You know, make sure that their toes are uh, uh, tied together as well and they're not flailing outwards. Uh, but you do that, scoop them up on a scoop stretcher, put them on a cot and remove the scoop stretcher, and that goes a long way. Uh, pelvic binders, a uh, variety of different types. Pelvic binders were developed by surgeons, for surgeons, in an operating room once they had fixed the fracture. Uh, in the field, we have no idea where those sharp bone ends are. We don't know which one of the bones is broken. And by applying a pelvic binder, we literally can take those broken bone ends and shove them right into the bladder. Now we got the bladder spilling into the abdominal cavity, and certainly those sharp bone ends on on a compression uh, could uh, also lacerate a uh, major artery or, or vein or nerve. Um, so I'm not a fan of sheets. Uh, sheets are just as bad as pelvic binders. Uh, everybody's going to apply it with a different amount of stress and pressure. Um, it's an inexact application of pressure. Pelvic binders, not a fan. Uh, I'm just old school, I guess. Uh, so a lot of controversy on how to stabilize them, but uh, certainly if you suspect pelvic instability, it needs to be stabilized. Uh, IV fluids, uh, if no radial pulses, uh, IVs in case you do need to add fluids later. Um, you can evaluate the pelvis for structural integrity just by compressing the iliac crests. You don't need to rock 
uh, rocking the pelvis is uh, really not necessary. Visualize the pelvis. Look at the legs. If one's externally rotated and shortened, uh, you know that may be a clue as well. I know that uh, an externally rotated and shortened uh, leg is is often seen with uh, hip fractures, uh, and a hip fracture doesn't have anything to do with the pelvis. A uh, hip fracture is a, um, a fracture to the um, head of the femur. Um, you want to assess for PMS, stabilize, assess for PMS again. The pneumatic kind of shock garment could work as a splint. Uh, the only problem I see with that is if it's not in place on the board, opened up and ready to go, when you put your patient into it, uh, you know, it can cause excessive movement uh, trying to get it uh, into position. Uh, you would inflate just the leg sections, and you'd have to do both legs. Uh, Sam slings stabilize while applying appropriate amount of pressure to the pelvis, and that's, you know, that's the, where the debate is right now. Uh, here's showing the pneumatic eye shot garments being used as a splint for both the extremities and the pelvis. And uh, here's a uh, SAM splint or a pelvic binder. Hip injuries are most common in the elderly. It includes an anterior or posterior dislocation of the femur, but it also can include a fracture of the proximal end of the femur. Uh, some of these occur without any mechanism of injury. Um, uh, particularly in the elderly. Uh, just uh, natural stress and aging and the thinness of the bone can just snap, uh, and then the patient falls. So when dealing with an elderly who fell, you know, did they fall and the fall cause the break of the femur, uh, or did the uh, spontaneous fracture of the femur cause the fall? Assess neurovascular function in the ext injured extremity before and after splinting. Get a good thorough history. Um, and of course, pain meds as well. Um, CMS, splinting, board, one large bore IV, uh, no need to give fluid unless there's an absent radial pulse. Uh, give them pain medications if their vital signs support it. And monitor their vitals every five minutes. Femur injuries, uh, massive force exerted on the, on the longest and the strongest bone in your body occurs in motor vehicle collisions or a pedestrian struck by a vehicle. Uh, occurs when you go up and over the handlebars of a motorcycle or a bicycle. Uh, these fractures are at risk of severe uh, bleeding from uh, femoral artery and veins, also can cause nerve damage. Blood loss could be as close to one to two liters, uh, which uh, in that case you would see signs of shock. Uh, assess PMS uh, distally. Uh, look at the other leg. You know, you've got a twin, so compare it for uh, things like swelling and deformity. Uh, immobilize the injured area. That could be with a Sager or a hair traction because we're talking about mid-shaft femur fractures. If they are hypotensive, uh, as evident by no radial pulses, we'd want to give them uh, fluid bolus um, and assess uh, PMS after uh, immobilizing the extremity as well. Knee injuries, you can have a fractured femur, fractured tib or fib, or a fractured patella. The joint also could be dislocated, uh, or patella and ligament damage can occur. Um, the popliteal artery runs behind the knee, and so you want to get a good thorough history, do an assessment to make sure that that popliteal artery has not been uh, damaged. Uh, you could uh, uh, not a fan of uh, running somebody through a full range of motion uh, unless I'm pretty certain there's no chance of uh, fracture. Um, evaluate uh, pedal pulses, evaluate popliteal pulses, uh, and examine the distal femur and proximal tibia for swelling and deformity. Uh, signs and symptoms of a knee injury, swelling of the knee, loss of movement, lots of pain. You're going to mobilize the leg, control the pain, uh, splint the knee with soft or rigid splints in the position that it's found, uh, CMS before and after splinting, ice and elevation, just like you would any other fracture. Tibia and fibula injuries, uh, stress fractures to the fibula if the bone is overused. It's, uh, you know, there's your, there's your shin splints. Uh, commonly, both uh, tib and fibula will be broken. Uh, you want to assess for deformity, swelling, angulation. Treatment is like we do any extremity 
uh, CMS before and after splinting, uh, IV for uh, pain medications and perhaps a fluid bolus if their pressure's low, uh, elevate ice and um, if vital signs support it, something for the pain. Foot and ankle injuries, uh, mechanism of injury for foot and ankle injuries include falls from heights, <coughs> excuse me, uh, rotational forces, crushing forces, um, calcaneus injuries, um, are often referred to as the Don Juan fractures. Uh, this occurs in somebody who falls off a ladder, falls off a roof, and lands on their heels. Uh, it will uh, uh, fracture and crush both heel bones. Uh, it's a uh, lengthy surgery. Uh, it's uh, uh, You wouldn't think that a little cup or a little heel bone uh, could uh, pose such a, a huge problem, but um, usually there are permanent disabilities as a result of fracturing your calcaneus bone. Uh, get a, a complete history to determine the mechanism of injury, evaluate PMS before and after. Consider the presence of other injuries because the, when they land on their heels, if their calcaneus bones don't fracture, uh, that force can be transmitted up the leg and you can have all kinds of potential for uh, ankle injuries, knee injuries, low back injuries even as, uh, uh, as the lower part of the uh, body uh, comes to a stop and the upper part of the body continues to drive downward uh, on top of that, you can get uh, compression fractures of the low back. Uh, treat it like we do any extremity fracture, pulse motor sensory before and after splinting, uh, establish an IV, ice and elevate, and consider pain meds. Uh, the whole purpose of splinting is to immobilize the joint, to prevent further injury, to help relieve pain, to decrease swelling, to decrease bleeding, uh, a wide variety of, of, of reasons to splint, uh, and it's a, something very simple that we can do that makes a big difference with extremity injuries. Uh, ice, 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, and then pain meds uh, for... Uh, um, severe pain. Uh, one other thing that we're seeing done as well, and I didn't, I haven't seen it listed here in any of the slides, is the administration of a anti-anxiolytic. Uh, so giving them something for anxiety as well as giving them something for pain, again, would go a long way in uh, making this patient comfortable. Fluid replacement, you may lose significant blood from internal and uh, external uh, injury to extremities. Uh, if you want to begin replacement as soon as you're aware that that's what's necessary, uh, treat injuries and transportation should not delay uh, to start your IV. So, you know, if, if, if uh, we can immobilize these patients quickly, get them on the road, we can start the IV en route, give them fluid bolus if radial pulses are absent. Um, as far as field reductions go, and that's... Um, uh, removing a dislocation or trying to reduce a dislocation in the field that really is going to determine on how far away you are from your emergency department. I would work closely with your medical directors and your orthopods uh, to determine when that would be necessary. Uh, extremities can go a long time without a blood supply and if you're close uh, to an, uh, an emergency department with uh, an ED physician or, uh, or an orthopod, uh, it's best to let them do the uh, um, the reduction of the dislocation uh, or the significant deformity in a more controlled environment. Um, your assessment findings to know that you may need to do a reduction include lack of distal pulses, inability to move, and uh, lack of sensation. Uh, if you know, if this goes on for hours, there is a potential that the extremity will be lost. Uh, you're going to do all the things we do for splinting, uh, elevate ice, uh, IV, uh, and uh, pain meds. Uh, rules for reduction, perform only if a delay could be harmful to the patient's outcome, perform only if it can be accomplished without delaying transport. Uh, IV isotonic crystalloids should be started before so that you can give uh, pain medications and anti-anxiolytics. Uh, then grasp the injured extremity firmly, apply traction uh, on the long axis of the bone, uh, allow time for the surrounding muscles to relax and continue to apply traction until reduced or put back in the anatomically correct position.
If you experience undue resistance, immediately stop and transport. Uh, splint after the reduction as well, PMS after the reduction as well. Uh, indications for a successful reduction, you may hear a pop as the uh, extremity falls back into its normal anatomic position. Uh, pain may be relieved <clears throat> and um, the deformity may be reduced uh, as well as the extremity may be able to move. Do understand that uh, with a dislocation, uh, the uh, ligaments and the uh, tendons are going to be overstretched and uh, may actually even be torn, uh, in which case, um, if you do not splint the reduction, um, there's a potential that with movement they could dislocate it again. All right, with that, if you have any questions, uh, you know how to get a hold of me. Thanks, and I'll uh, talk to you soon.